Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining Dr. Rob's live Q&A. Minus Dr. Rob, he's in traffic right now. So he texted me that he would be arriving in just a few minutes. So this will be a little disjointed. We'll take a pause. But a couple of people had questions and I won't um, completely answer them. I'll let Dr. Rob chime in. But somebody talked about their, their partner is leaving the Seeking Integrity um, Los Angeles program soon. And wanted to know as his, as this person's spouse what they can expect in changes so so each of our um you know for each of our clients who has a partner there is a letter that is sent on what to expect during and during the process so hopefully you've gotten that hopefully you've also been in contact with the therapist the the seeking integrity therapist they typically um as long as there are releases that are signed are in contact with the the clients, um, loved ones, partners, or spouses, as well. So, um, but you know what I, you know, what I say to people when they send their loved one is, we can't fix everything in the short time that that they're with us. But what I, I really do see transformation, and you you hopefully will see dots, you know, that you can kind of connect where you go. Gosh, they're they're working on having some more empathy. They're working on rebuilding trust. They're not going to get it right 100%. They're still going to lie, but they've been given tools to use so that they, you know, that if they're lying, they, you know, they come back to you within whatever their program is, you know, whatever is set up. But, but I think a lot of it is, you know, conversations, you know, um, I, th I think you have this opportunity to 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 have those dialogues and you know and ask that person you know how it's affected them and you know what they see i'll tell you one of the the best things in my in my perfect world as i've said to other people you know i love it when um you know when they come and then the two of you are able to do the couples healing from betrayal workshop because some of the goals for that are um I'm pulling it up so I don't uh, say it wrong. Rebuilding trust, genuine forgiveness, intimacy, establishing and implementing healthy boundaries, communication skills. And I think that one is huge. Learning how to have respectful and productive conflicts. Of course, there's going to be conflicts, but learning how to do that in a, you know, in a different way. Grieving losses together. I think a lot of the clients are figuring out the losses, um, the, the loss of what they thought you both have, you know, it, it, the loss of what the relationship you know, who should have been, you know, when you got together, what your expectations were and all of that, um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, the illusion of, you know, what, what we had, you know, like all of those things. I mean, there, there's genuine losses on both sides and, um, you know, and grieving those losses together can be a powerful thing and uh, owning and understanding it. Um, uh, spirituality, healthy sexuality, enjoying time playing together and planning for continued recovery and healing. So um, I do want to say we are talking about having a pro-dependent partner intensive. We've had so many people request this. And so finally, um, which tells you we have no life, but um, uh, Kim and Karen and I had a conversation on New Year's Eve um, earlier. So, um, but I saw, yeah, I wasn't going out. Um, uh, but we talked about, you know, we've had so many people request us and we've not been able to make it happen yet. So what would it take? So we're hopeful of having that offering, um, you know, for an initial offering in April. And it would be um, from a very pro-dependent standpoint. Um, uh, but uh, uh, Kim Buck, who does our pro-dependence webinars, you know, has materials that she's created that she uses in her practice. And all of those things could be really powerful and intensive. So stay tuned. You know, I think that that will be great support for you. Hopefully as a partner, you're also working with a pro-dependent aligned support therapist, you know, so that they're, you know, they're helping you. So, so the, the very long answer to your short question is you, you, there, there will, there should be changes. He's, but you're not going to go, oh, oh, this person is transformed. On another note though, I had a partner call me like middle middle of December um, and her loved one had come her spouse had come to treatment in the summer I can't remember which month doesn't matter but she said I don't know what you did but I got a different man back than the one I sent she said I wasn't she wasn't still trusting a hundred percent which she shouldn't um, but she said we really actually like each other and they spend time talking you know together every evening and you know, he's plugged into the alumni group on, um, on this. So the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles group has a, 
um, an alumni drop-in group. So it's just for that, those alumni. And he's plugged into that. And he heard about the couples workshop and they were reaching out about that because he thought it'd be fun, you know? And I'm like, well, that's great that you want to spend time with your, you know, with your loved one like that. So, so she said life-changing. I hear consistently from um, the, the alumni too, that it's life-changing for them. And, you know, we really want it to be life-changing, not just for the person that has a, uh, attended, but also for you who has, you know, entrusted that person to us. Um, it's, this is all really challenging work, you know, for them. And it's one of those things where, um, uh, you, you know, it, it's given a, a certain amount of time when they have patterns that are really old and have, you know, have been in place for a long time. So, but interrupting them and giving them ways to do things different. For the guys that follow the aftercare plan, I think they have a really high rate of success, you know, in, in having things different. For the guys that go home and don't do anything differently, I would say the odds are, you know, are slim, but, you know, so hopefully, you know, hopefully, um, and you should be aware of what the aftercare plan is as his therapist would be, you know, so that everybody's on the same page as, as you um, move forward with that. So hopefully that's some information and I'll, um, I'll, I'll hold the question and um, we'll see what if Dr., you know, what Dr. Rob has um, to add to that. So the, another question is I attended last uh, Thursday night's drop-in group on shame. Would I love to be reviewing it again? Is it recorded? Thanks for asking that. The drop-in groups are never recorded. Um, because that's really a place where, so, so the difference for, um, uh, the difference for doing a, a drop-in group or the, um, uh, hang on, Dr. Rob just popped in, but I can't find him. So, oh, there you are. Hi there. The difference for doing a drop-in group is that like Dr. Rob and I can see each other, you get to see other people. So you get to see the face of, you know, someone else who identifies as, you know, a, a sex and love addict or as a betrayed partner or whatever it is that, um, you know, that the purpose of that group. So we don't record those. We want those to be a safe space. So, you know, keep coming back. But that webinar that I mentioned that Matt Wheeler is going to be doing, he does that on attachment as well. So it'll be another uh, spot. Those will be recorded. So those will be on alternating Fridays. And those will be recorded so you can continue to go back and review that information. So Dr. Rob, we're thrilled to see you. So, so I've been holding the space for you. So Happy New Year to you, Tammy. Yeah, you too. So I love the sunset tonight. Is That's lovely. So It is nice. The sun is going down. Yeah, so it's dark you here. You know what? Right. I want the sun to go down at 7, not at 5. I'm, I love the late evening hours. Uh, 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 the, yes, it's completely dark here. But the other thing is I'm not going around my blinds and shoving my curtains shut because it was setting on me. So, you know, I'm in a different in a different area of the country. So it, uh, it affects me. Don't so. let the sun go down on you. On Tim. you, yes. I won't sing because everybody <laughs> would hang up really fast. But So I answered the... Um, I answered, I'm going to, this one I'm going to take care of, but if you take a look at the first question, it's my partner is scheduled to leave um, the, our program uh, you know, soon. And so, you know, I kind of went on a, a lot about ex ex I heard a little bit of that. Oh, you I did? Okay. Watching. Did you yeah. have, did you have any um, additional thoughts or comments? That you, you know, only to say this, I, um, because it was a holiday, I got on the alumni group. So part of what we do in treatment, we do in treatment is we try to maintain relationships with, between um, the, among the people who went through treatment together, among the people who went through treatment at our agency, and among us, so that we can keep, because we understand, you know, we are the foundation that you built this new life on, and m even more than us, it's the other peers that you went through the work with. So we provide an opportunity for every group that goes through to connect with each other, and then everyone to continue to go to online alumni groups, so that they can meet for a year if they want to after treatment and support each other. And we'll drop in, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally and say, hey, how's it going, whatever. But my point about that was that I went to the alumni group over the holiday. And I was really glad I did because <clears throat> there's a gentleman that we have. I mean, obviously, I can't say anything about him personally, but he was really struggling. He had called a, he'd called a sex worker. He was looking for drugs. He was in trouble. And he hadn't found what he was looking for over the weekend. And this was like Tuesday last week. And when we talked through, you know, where he was at, and there were, you know, a bunch of alumni there. It was very clear that he had prioritized um, his family, he prioritized his work, he prioritized a hobby that he's really involved with, but he had not prioritized recovery. 
it was like, I think sometimes people think, well, I'll go home and I'll just plug myself back into the life I had. And, and just, I have a few new, like, um, uh, aware, I have a new awareness, so everything's going to be fine. And here's the problem with being a human being. Um, we don't retain information that long. And especially information as serious and as deep seated as, you know, that, that will counter things like acting out, which is pretty, pretty early brain stuff. So anyway, what I said with him is, what are you doing related to the list of things we talked about you're doing when you go home? Because I, I've been doing treatment for 24 years and I can tell you that almost 201, when somebody calls me and they say they're struggling and they've been through treatment three weeks ago or three months ago, it's because they're not following the plan that we sat down and made for them. When we sit with people, when you are in treatment, you spend every little bit, a little teeny bit of every day looking at how you're going to work on these same things when you get out in the world. By the end of the time you've spent with us, we're sitting and writing, okay, so you need this support, you need to do that, you need to, and that's an information, uh, that those papers, that aftercare plan, if you will, is sent to the therapist, it goes home with the per person who's got the issues, and I think spouses are great to have a copy because it's really good, I think, for you guys to know, well, what has he been or she been asked to do? No, she's in our program, but nonetheless, what has this person in treatment been asked to do? Because honestly, the truth is, I see people fall on their face nine times out of 10 because they simply think, well, I got a handle around this because I went to treatment and, all, and they forget all about the hours that we put into sitting with them and organizing a plan specific to them and their schedule and their life and their doctors and whatever so that they can get better. So. You know, I, I, I feel strongly about this particular point, Tammy, because I think we work really hard trying to help people, and I know we do. And yet some folks, folks, they walk out and they feel the energy of what we've done. They feel excited and enthusiastic and encouraged. But then they that feeling kind of fades because it's a pink cloud. You know, we've been taking care of you for weeks. and But then they get home and they're not in a pink cloud and they just kind of shrink back into their own habits and behaviors. And it isn't the work that we do or any treatment center that's going to make the difference in your life. What the difference is, what do you take from that and how do you live that out at home? Because addiction is a lifelong problem. You will have lifelong challenges emotionally if you have addiction. And that requires lifelong discipline and plans for change that, that can't be defined by I feel like it today or I don't feel like it today. They have to be, this is what I agreed to do. And this is what I'm going to do because the people who know me best in this work I'm doing, they help me figure this stuff out. So I'm going to do what they said. And I challenge any person who's been through treatment to call me up and say, I'm on my treatment plan. I'm doing everything that's there. And it's still not working because it's usually the first place I look. So anyway, just to bounce off what you said, Tim. Yeah, no, a hundred percent agree. I often get asked, what are the odds? And I, 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 and I, and we don't know, we don't, you know, have all of that, um, that information. And it would be very challenging for anybody to get very accurate information. But I said, my suspicion is if they are following the aftercare plan that was made for them, that I bet it's close to a hundred percent. And if they are not following that plan, I bet it's not very good at all, period. You know. And, and let me say something about that, Tammy, because the purpose of the plan on every level is to put the person who's struggling in connection with support, whether that's encouraging them to go to a group therapy or a therapist or a 12-step meeting. Whoops, did I lose you? I'm a little tech. You, you froze, but I, you were a little garbled, but we, you, you're back. The plan is that we put so you in all the part. Was saying, well, again, you're fading in and out. Oops, he, we, we lost Dr. Rob again. He'll be back. It, I think it's his Wi-Fi. So, uh, oh, this is a good question, but I need Dr. Rob for that one. Um, what is the connection? Hi, Dr. Rob. You're back. So, all I, and the sunset's still the same. All, all I was saying was that um, all of the plans that we make really for the person is to put them in connection with other people who are healing, whether that's a group therapy or a 12-step program or a couples group or the more opportunities people have to get out of their house and get out of their lives and get into recovery means hanging out with other people who will support and listen and the more they do that the better and so what we put a lot of genuine generous i can't say that word a generous portion of connection into those aftercare plans and unfortunately it's very common for people when they get home to kind of like 
you know, kind of get back in their own little bubble. And the plans are purposely designed to keep them out of getting in that bubble. So, yeah. Well, and it can be a struggle. I'm, you know, from a betrayed partner standpoint, you know, you, you've gone off to treatment, you come home and now you're gone all the time because you're going into all the support stuff. And I a hundred percent get that. And, but I'm also going, they will not be at all helpful for you if they don't do what they need to do, especially early on to get that foundation under them. So, so, so finding that right balance, you know, of how to, you know, how to navigate that takes takes work and effort and hopefully you're getting some support from you know a qualified therapist even you know even some of the other webinars and stuff you know where you're getting how do we navigate this and I want to add to what Tammy said because she's right you know we um you're uh what do I want to say now um gosh I lost it but do we have more questions by the way I want we to do yeah yeah so okay. this is what's the connection between porn addiction and domestic abuse I spoke very nicely almost begging to soon to be ex-husband baby daddy about his porn addiction last Saturday and the conversation escalated and he dismissed me cut me off and I was talking and swung his hand towards me um, he was able to stop himself I'm now getting flashbacks of his raging face and his hand coming towards me and I'm afraid to see him but impossible since we live in the same house the other time he got physical with me, grabbed, shook me, was when I confronted him about his porn treasure trove. Is there a connection or is abuse a separate issue? Um, abuse is a separate issue. And I don't mean that. Let me try this. Abuse in the form of I'm lying to you. I'm keeping secrets from you. I'm hiding things from you. I'm, I'm, I'm manipulating the situation so I can go out and have sex with other people or whatever. That's a given. That, that abuse is an all the addicts because they're more focused on getting what they want than the relationship when they're in their addiction but actually physical abuse is a whole is a separate issue um, having treated sex addicts and porn addicts for many many years um, domestic violence is not a big one on our scale I think there's a lot of reasons for that um, honestly not to go too far into it but one of the challenges that sex addicts have is being assertive and standing up for themselves, believe it or not. We would rather go off and do something and piss you off than actually tell you, or, or we would rather get our knees met somewhere else than actually ask for most addicts and sex addicts in particular, really saying what you need, really saying what you want, setting good back, that's hard for us. So, um, I, but, but, so taking it to the point where I would actually harm someone is not typical for us, and it is a very serious issue. So let me say this, I'm concerned for you. Um, this is not okay on any level, especially if he's not come. If the last time he went, he hit you, or threw you, or whatever he did to you, if he didn't get some help for it, it will return and it will be worse the next time. Um, and there's a pattern to this. We call there's a whole domestic violence pattern where people act out and they hit people and then they feel really bad and then they make lots of apologies and then the company go, couple goes into a honeymoon period and they're trying to make it better and then he hits you again. And that cycle is incredibly demeaning, um, incredibly harmful to your soul. It can teach partners something we call learned hopelessness, which is a sense of no matter what I do, it's not gonna get better and I'm the problem. And so I think you're already in trouble. I think you already need intervention. This concerns me very much. I would not confront him at all again, considering he can't handle confrontation. I would ask him maybe to go to therapy with you about the fact that he hit you or try to a second time, and then I bring those issues up in therapy and see how he handles it with a professional in the room. But his inability, I'll tell you what is from similar to addiction. His inability to tolerate his feelings and have to act on them, whether he's running away to sex or porn or whether he's just acting out by hitting. I mean, on, in some level, addiction is about my inability to manage my feelings and make good decisions around my feelings. And so from that perspective, my ability to manage my angry feelings and not lash out at you physically is something that can be handled in a similar way to addiction, but they're different issues. Um, and I really, really hope you get professional help because I don't like hearing these stories and they get worse. And I heard you're pregnant. So, no, the, um, uh, no, has a soon to be ex-husband, baby daddy. So, so, but there's a kiddo involved. So yeah, yeah I think so I know this story. I think you've heard, somehow I think I've heard from these folks before because I, I remember this story. And um, in this particular story, and it's not unusual, this is the father of my children. I don't care that he's done this and the other. Surely he'll come around and be a better guy just to be parent that child. And I have to say that that is always true. Um, I live with someone whose father cut him off at 16 and hasn't spoken to him since he's 45. Is the guy's only son. So 
I know that men can be very angry, very bitter, and act out in ways that are really harmful. So yeah, I just hope you're getting all the help you need for yourself. And I would not broach this again. You know, you're unsafe because if you're around him when he's acting out, you're such all of that. If you bring up the acting out, he's going to rage at you. And that puts you in a really impossible situation. So I would try to avoid a lot of contact um, and keep it to kids. And we have a term in treatment. We call it news, weather, and sports. This is something that every client who comes to Seeking Integrity learns, meaning we don't want them to bring up really upsetting, really big deal things on the phone with you. We want them in the evenings. If you're in treatment with us, we want you to get on, the people with treatment with us, to get on the phone with your family and your kids and say hi and have a relationship, but not to get in all, all the drama and issues. And I would say you're sort of in the similar place. You really can't talk about this stuff. You have to do news, weather, and sports with him. But here's the good news. You're not married to him anymore. He's not going to be in the house. So try to minimize your challenges of him unless you feel they're affecting the kids because ultimately um, you got out of this relationship for a reason and it isn't going to be any better just because you're separate, for it, sadly. Okay. At what point into recovery would you recommend couples therapy? Does it make sense to begin this prior to disclosure? Um, this is a great question. I think couples therapy is really helpful in the very beginning when a couple's in chaos around uh, infidelity to set the rules. Like, are you going to leave or not? Are you going to tell the kids or not? Um, what are we going to do about when I leave town? You know, whatever the issues are, the day-to-day Meaning, group, couples therapy is really good, I think, in the beginning for we're so angry and we're so hurt and we're dealing with so much reactivity, but we still have to figure out how to live our lives and we often live together. So I think couples therapy in the beginning, therapy is, in the beginning is good for negotiating the process of simply figuring out how to get along day to day, especially around kids and family and work when you're so angry and hurt. But the deep work of, gro of couples growth I don't really think comes until after disclosure because, um, and maybe even a while after that, because real couples therapy, I think takes place when some of the reactivity has died down and you're able to address each other in a way that is more respectful and, um, and more aware of the bigger issues rather than I'm so pissed right now. You can go to therapy with your partner and tell them how pissed you are and they can say, well, what do I do? But ultimately I think, Anyway, so I think early therapy for couples is good for setting boundaries. I would have a session or two pre-disclosure, just so you know who their therapist is, what the situation is, what it's going to be like, the general issues you're going to talk about. But I don't think the couple's therapy is going to indicate it until the two of you are in a more peaceful place. Okay. Uh, next question. I have a question about my lying and deception that I continue to do. This weekend, I went and took a polygraph that was concerning my infidelity. I passed the polygraph, which was awesome. The feeling I got from the past polygraph results was a feeling, it was a freeing feeling. First I felt sadness and then I was so relieved that I finally told the truth for the first time in over 30 years. And knowing my wife was happy, I told the truth, but also still heartbroken from the infidelity lies and deceptions that I've been doing for our, for our whole relationship. Today my wife asked me a question about uh, if I looked at women and fantasizing about them, if she was with me in public while I was active in my addiction, my response immediately was no, and I was being dishonest. Oh, right. The answer is, of course. Yes. My question is, why am I still being dishonest even after I got the fe freeing feeling what I got from the polygraph? Do you have any suggestions that I could help myself work through the difficult questions and prevent me from making the decision to lie? It's a great question. I mean, so I, I want, I'm going to quiz you on this too, Tammy, but I think lying comes out of fear. And, you know, I lie because I'm afraid what will happen if I tell the truth. That's why I lie. I'm afraid you'll get angry. I'm afraid you'll leave me. I'm afraid uh, we won't have a good evening. You know, I'm, uh, usually that's fear to me what drives, but there are other reasons. But I would look to yourself and say, why, what am I afraid of? If she finds out, if we discuss, if you, what am I afraid of? That she's going to go back into upset? Okay. Um, she would rather you're honest than you lie and keep her from being upset, I promise. Um, for me, fear was always about, I don't want to be the cause of the pain, even though I am the cause of the pain. And, uh, and honestly, I want to say to you that if you're a man, or if this is a man, I, I think that a lot of, well, I'm just going to say this. I think for many, many years now, I have my sole job on many levels has been growing boys into men. And men are able to sit in front of their spouses and people they love and say, look, this is my shit, this is what I did, and I own it. That's being an adult male. 
is so if you're a little kid and you're afraid that mom's going to yell at you if she finds out you stole a cookie from the cookie jar and you're coming from that little kid place you're not really going to be able to stand up for your wife as an adult as a partner if you're coming from the place of i am a husband i am a responsible adult and it is my job to support us by being honest if you come from that place you won't be afraid so i would examine what it, in fact, I'd even talk about it with your wife. You know, like I sometimes, I'm mean, truthful, you know that. Let me tell you what's going on. When you get angry, this is how I feel. This is stuff you can work on. I have a rule with clients and some of the clients who are in Seeking Integrity right now, I've already discussed this with them, which is I have clients who say, you know, I just lie. I lie automatically. I lie right away, especially if it's coming at me like this. I just can't help but lie. And my response is I perfectly get that. So why don't we make an agreement? You get to lie for 24 hours. You can tell me X, Y, Z, but I expect within 24 hours, you're going to come back and say, I'm really sorry. You know, it was hard for me to tell the truth right facing you. Do this with your spouse. Tell her that it is hard for you to face someone when they're angry and you're afraid of their reaction. So you might always not tell the truth in the moment, but you're committed to within 12 hours or 24 hours going back and telling the truth. That's a great start. If you can't get there right in the moment, at least get there in the short term. It's a great beginning. And I'm going to tell you, that. you want to say anything about well, I was going to say, because because uh, even if they're not angry, I hear you you feeling bad about the hurt. And I could see that you were tying, tagging into that and going, if I tell her the truth, it's going to hurt her and I don't want to hurt her more. So so even if it's not from the anger, but like there's a negative feeling regardless of if it's angry or hurt or whatever it is, sadness. Um, but I, you know, I do think the um, I've got 24 hours to clean it up. You know, and I think owning that with your wife and saying, I'm going to lie, but you, like I just, that's just my pattern, but I'm, you know, I'm committing to you that I will come back in 24 hours. And if you, if you have that agreement with her and you do that, that's part of rebuilding trust. So even if you lie in the moment and hopefully as you start going, gosh, like now I've been sitting, <laughs> right. Here's my thing is I hate going to have to make amends. So it's just yes, better to go do. clean it up. Yeah, but I'd rather clean it up in the first place. Like, otherwise, if I have to think about it for 24 hours, I'm 24 hours of miserable. And, and it's just easier to go, you know, I'm like, I lied to you an hour ago, and I'm really sorry. And I'm going to, you know, I'm owning that now. And hopefully that window gets shorter and shorter, so that you don't feel like you have to, um, you know, like, don't wait till 23 hours, 59 minutes is what I'm, you know, inviting you to do. But, but I think setting up that up as a plan when it's not in the moment. So when you're having an opportunity for a right. conversation, so it's not in the heat of the moment or whatever, um, you know, I think that'll give you a really solid foundation. So. Hey, Tammy, I want to say something about the question itself, though. Yeah. Which was, my wife asked me when I was in my addiction, did I look at other women with lust, basically, when I was with her? And, and, and folks, I got to tell you, every man who's ever existed, has looked at other men or women with lust when they were with their partners. <laughs> it's called being human. Um, there's a great difference between finding someone attractive and then going back to the person you're with and focusing on that person who's attractive and being not available for the person you're with. And there's an even bigger difference between that and going off with that person at some point. So, But everyone, if you're human, is attracted to people. And even sex addicts, you know, this is one of the challenges with sex addiction and food addictions, is that when people have a compulsive behavior related to a naturally occurring function, like food or sex, <clears throat> not, not saying it's easy on Tammy, but quitting alcohol is a little bit easier because you can live your life and just never have alcohol and life mm -hmm. can be pretty fun. Mm -hmm. But you really don't want to live your life without eating or having sex. So when we integrate this back in, you know, your partner's going to be suspicious of every time you look at someone and they have to learn over time that there is a healthy looking. And they'll feel it, by the way. You look at someone, you look away, they'll get it. You look at someone, you look so longer, you look a few minutes, you're doing some of this. They see that too. So <clears throat> yes, in your addiction, your probably wife probably picked up on it. If she picks on it now, up on it now, and you're really just, hmm, and you go back to, then I would say that's just healthy human behavior. And we can't, we're not about desexualizing ourselves. It's about being present for the people we're with and still acknowledging our body. Yeah, I, I actually was thinking about that too, that, because the question, and I get why the partner would want to know those things. I mean, a hundred percent get, but it's, but it is, it don't, you know, it's almost a trap because like you said, you know, of right. course, you know, of course. So, so a little, a little cleanup for you to do on aisle five. So.
So my <laughs> husband is in recovery as his betrayed, uh, uh, like my husband is in recovery as his betrayed partner. How can I support his recovery? What are the do's and don'ts? Do you want to start this one? Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, like, he is in charge of his recovery. You are in charge of getting support for you. You've been traumatized. You have, you have all kinds of stuff that has happened to you through no fault of yours. His addiction is his addiction. He was going to do it or not do it. it. You know, it's got nothing to do with you. So I think the biggest thing, so here's what I told me because, so yeah, you know, I went to treatment, I came back and my parents had, I moved back in with my parents, long story, but um, I was young. Um, the, uh, my parents were like afraid of having alcohol around. And I told him, I said, here's the deal. It's my deal. It's my deal. You know, if I really, really want whatever, like I'm going to go find it. So, so I had to learn to take care of myself and they, they gave me space and support around that. But for you, I would, I would really encourage you to make sure you're getting support um, and listening to the podcast. There's all kinds of educational things. So you just have a better understanding that his brain, you know, is, is now funky. It's, you know, off in a different direction and he's got tools to use to be able to function in the real world. But it's going to take time. So the thoughts and practice, practice, yeah, practice, practice. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Other questions. Uh, could you please talk a bit about sexual anorexia? What is the treatment? I've had periods of acting out with men for many years while sexually withdrawing from my wife, same sex couple. <laughs> okay. Well, there's a lot of pieces to this pie um, because it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, first of all, I don't know what sexual, sexual anorexia is. The word anorexia belongs to the eating disorder world. So if you're talking about someone, if you're someone who avoids sex with your partner or doesn't have, or kind of minimizes, I, I think of other words. So I'm, I'm assuming, Tammy, this means somebody who maybe uh, got out of their addiction or is working, but no longer is having sex with their partner kind of thing and is wondering how to reignite partner sexuality. Is that Maybe the question. It, it, that's what it sounds like to me that, you know, I can have okay. sex with people that I don't care about, but when there's intimacy, when I care about this person, then I'm, yeah. And I'm assuming this is a man, just guessing. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it could be. We're drawing from my wife. I'm, I'm honestly thinking female. So, because okay. it says, um, so here's we're drawing from my wife, same sex couple. So, yeah. Oh, same sex couple. So, yeah. um, the symptoms that you describe are very typical for someone who's experienced early life trauma. Um, when you've experienced early life trauma, we are often challenged with intimacy and relationships. So I'm looking for the questions I want to answer it more specifically, Tammy. Uh, hold on a second. Let's see if I can find it. You know, I don't have that one. Um, can you tell me a little bit more because I wanted to get more so into it. So could you please talk about sexual anorexia? What right. is the treatment? I've had periods of acting out with men for many years while sexually withdrawing from my wife, same sex couple. Okay, so here's, there are a number of things and I don't know your situation. So I'm just going to speak generally and please everybody understand that when Tammy and I say things, we're not talking about your situation. We don't know you. We can't see you. We don't even know your name. So we're talking about these situations in general as we should because that's our opportunity to educate everyone. Um, so um, it's not unusual when couples are together for long periods of time for sexuality to fade away. Um, couples, sexuality thrives often on novelty. And so couples that can keep sex fresh and interesting and fun for them can ha are more likely to have longer term sexual relationships. Um, for lesbian women, there are issues sometimes around enmeshment or women getting too close, too tied up in each other's business, too overly involved in each other's emotional lives, like my fingers, and then they just can't quite pull each other apart. And you need to have some distance to be sexual. You need to be able to see the person, not as your mom, not as your best, but you know, you need to sort of see them as an object a little bit. And so it's, so there are many answers to your question. I'm going to give a number of them. One is lesbian women can lose, um, sexuality and live for long periods of time not being sexual because they thrive on the, on the relationship connection they lose their sexuality which is something that needs to work done in therapy because it takes work to keep your sexuality alive number two separate issue long-term couples in general lose their sexual desire for each other and sometimes will seek novelty and then when you've been with someone for and just understand this no offense but if i've seen that butt or those boobs or whatever it is for the last 12 years I've seen them, you know, and they're very nice, but they, I don't go, ooh, no offense, because I've seen them a lot of times. And, but the thing on the street, you know, that new piece of candy isn't ooh, because I've never seen it or touched it. So 
the question is really about how do I grow sexual intimacy with someone I've been with for a long time? And why do I lose my desire to be sexual with them? And I have to say that for those of us who act out sexually with other people and seek intensity and novelty through a lot of uh, partners other than our primary partner, but we re we withdraw from sex with our partners, it's often a trauma issue because what's ultimately going on is you're af we are afraid of deeply diving into the relationship sexually because it means brings us closer. And when you have trauma, oftentimes we want to kind of negotiate the distance we have someone. We don't want them to get too close, we want them too far away. We kind of want to manage and control the relationship because we have fears that are very early about being overwhelmed or being used. Or So if there's trauma, then that trauma will leave you enjoying the novelty sex, but being really quite afraid on some level of the sex with your partner. And therefore sex addiction in couples, um, and I know partners might respond to this, Oftentimes you're objectified when a sex addict is being sexual with you before we get into recovery. You're, you know, you're that, if we are being sexual with you, maybe we're fantasizing about someone else, or maybe we're not really present, and therefore we're able to do it. But when we're truly sexual with you in recovery, and this is kind of an important phrase, recovery for, sex in recovery for a sex addict, or a love addict, or someone with this kind of trauma, it has to come out of a willingness to be sexual, not horniness. And I know the men will identify with this and you might too. Um, when I'm a sex addict, I'm used to being sexual with images and people that are constantly fresh, constantly new. And that's a certain kind of arousal. Like, ooh, I see that, it turns me on, I want some of it. Kind of like chocolate cake. I saw some, I want some. But um, when you're in recovery and you've been with someone a long time, the, the sexuality has to come from the word I would use is willingness, not horniness, but willingness. So for you and your spouse, are you willing to lie together, to massage each other, to hold hands, to kiss? And you know what? You might start getting aroused and you know what? You might have sex. It's not going to come from that place of, ooh, baby, you're so hot. I can't wait to have sex with you because you've been with that person for 12 years. And if you expect sexuality to come from that place of, wow, you're hot and new, I want you, it's never gonna happen in your relationship because that's not what relationship sexuality is. Relationship sexuality doesn't come primarily out of horniness, it comes more out of connection. And since oftentimes us trauma survivors and sex addicts are fearful of not having control over connection, we avoid the sex because it gives us a sense of control. So all I'm saying is that sexuality with a partner has to do with being willing to enter the sexual realm, even though you're not particularly horny or aroused, but you're willing to try. And guess what? I got aroused and ooh, it was great. It may never come from, oh my God, I can't wait to be with you because we have issues. And those issues may keep us from pursuing our partners in that way, but we can still really enjoy being sexual with them. It just has to come from a different place. And I would invite you, if there is trauma, to get some support and help on repairing. Now, you can't repair it, but on... Um, Growing beyond it. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next question. I have been a severe addict throughout my entire marriage. My wife has asked if I ever really loved her. I feel like I loved her and still love her, but can an addict really love? Well, I hope so. I mean, I think so. I know many addicts despite all their craziness, who deeply love their kids, their family, their, it's just that you have to understand that when you are in an addiction, that is your primary, um, what's the word? Primary focus. When I'm in addiction, my primary focus is not to attend to my family or attend to my kid. It's to go have sex with strangers. And so I'm not, you know, if that is my primary focus, then everything else is going to fail and suffer. Um, it doesn't mean in fact, I can tell you many of us deeply love our partners, but kind of like the last person we were talking to, if you have trauma, if you act out sexually and you haven't worked through these issues, it's not unusual to say, oh, I'm, I'm not attracted to my partner anymore. They just don't interest me anymore. You know, to blame the partner for your own kind of withdrawing from sex. But the answer is absolutely, I think love without question can be fully intact. But let me talk about it this way. Tammy knows this story, I tell it sometimes. You know, I've worked with heroin addicts who took their kids' college fund to buy drugs. You know, they took their kids' money for school. And when they were heroin addicts, that's all that really mattered to them was getting that money for those drugs. But when they got sober, I have seen the same person work three jobs to pay that money back because it was so important to them. So I think an addict in their addiction is very narcissistic and self-focused 
by definition, it doesn't necessarily mean that underneath that we don't have very intact and meaningful connections with other people. That's not a priority. And so we don't treat them like they're priorities. I'm gonna say yes, but recovery love is different. It's like you were talking about, it's intentional, um, it's uh, relational, it's not you know, the hot sex and all of that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and you have the opportunity to focus on that other person and, and how that person has supported you probably during this entire addictive period where they got leftovers and scraps you know, instead of, you know, your primary focus, because your primary focus is over here. And, right. um, you know, so, so, so we, we do, I know so many couples that have um, found healing and a healing path together. It's different. And, and one of the, the people, um, one of the couples talked about eyes wide open. You know, we have a deep and abiding love for each other and eyes wide open. We're moving forward. I love that. I got goosebumps just you know, sharing that little tidbit with you. So, so I really do believe that there's hope. Do, do I think every couple is supposed to stay together? No. But, you know, for those where there is, you know, that, that, you know, those bits to, to build on, I think there's a lot of hope. And I have counted, and I would say at least 85 to 90% of the couples I've for 25 years have stayed together because couples have so many more reasons for staying together and sharing their love than infidelity. In the moment, it seems like the greatest crisis in the world. But when you've got kids and family and church and money and job, and if you're willing to be a more decent human being and a better partner, I always think it's worth giving the relationship a try. I'm a big relationship fan. Me too. Okay, so this, I tried to talk to him again because his mom tried to tell my mom that I was bipolar and paranoid for being jealous over his non-existent affair. I wanted to settle that and let him know it was inappropriate. This is the person that got shoved, so. Okay, so I will, this, I don't know if you're the same person that's been here before, but you sound like someone who's been here before who is separating from their partner. So we've had someone on, who's coming regularly that I've noticed, don't know who it is, don't know anything about them. Um, who keeps saying, I have a young child, I'm separating and divorcing, I want to maintain this relationship with him for the sake of my child, but I don't think he's that interested in the child anyway. But every time this person comes on, and I don't know if this is a person or not, but it's useful, similar, um, the question is, how do I get through to him? How do I make an impression on him? How do I get him to respond? How do I get him to listen to him? And you're not going to. I mean, this is why you're divorcing. And there is an expectation this, that people like this have that somehow he's going to turn around and listen. There are people who turn around. I have seen people walk back in three years later and say, I wish I'd never divorced you, but they're rare. By the time you've gone through all this crap with somebody, you pretty much know who they are. And if this man is still being abusive to you on any level, I really have to discourage you from continuing to engage him other than news, weather, and sports. It doesn't matter what your mother said. It doesn't matter what anybody said. You need to remain calm and focused. You have a child to take care of. What he thinks or what his family thinks is none of your business. Let him go. That's the most important thing I can say to you. You have a child who needs your attention. This asshole that you married does not. Let him go. And I wanted to tag on, you can't stop your mom from talking to his mom, but you can sure tell your mom, please don't tell me. If, if you have conversations with them, I don't want to know. So That's healthy right. boundary for you. So, you know, I, you know, ideally she doesn't even engage with his mom, but if she does, just don't, don't bother sharing, don't want to know. It just adds fuel to the fire, which does me no good, so. Okay, what does healthy attachment look, feel like? I came from a very dysfunctional background. I was literally thrown away as garbage at age 15. I'm working on myself and getting functional and healthy, but when do you know an attachment to a person is healthy and normal? I am so sorry, I'm so glad you're here, so. Dr. Yeah, I, I'm just touched by the feelings. And listen, we I won't say we've all been there because I don't want to be trite, but almost everyone here has dealt with trauma, abuse, having to re-heal, rediscover how to connect. I mean, this is what this work is about. Um, I, I really want to speak from personal experience here just a bit. Um, I think that having, and I had enormous trauma when I was a child, a very mentally ill mom, and she was running around naked and going in and out of hospitals. My mother was just completely psychotic and crazy and my family didn't handle it very well. And so I was pretty much alone as a child. And I, what, I, what I would ask you to reflect on is, haven't you already had some attachments? Like I am, and this may not be true for you, but are there friends you have who have meaning to you or a sister or a brother or, because attachment is attachment is attachment. If you feel connected to someone that you love, if you think about them, you worry about them, they're in your mind, 
um, you're attached to them. And it, you know, it's sort of a degree of attachment. You know, I'm not as attached to my cousins as I am to my spouse, but I'm attached to them. And if something happened to my cousins or where they live, I'd probably be calling and checking in what's going on in your city or because I feel connected to them. And, and in a way this seems silly, but it's gonna seem really silly to you asking this very serious question, but I'm more attached to people because of Facebook. There are people I know from high school that I used to like, but I like them better now because we talk more. And so the bottom line of an attachment is I think it has to do with having someone in mind, meaning in your mind, meaning do they come to mind? Do you think about them? Do, do you reflect on them in different situations that you walk into? Do, they, do, do they, you think about how it would affect them? I mean, uh, uh, for an example, I, uh, this is stupid, but uh, uh, okay, this is really dumb. This is great attachment. So Tammy, you'll make fun of me. When I go shopping for clothes, I, I can't help but buy something for my husband. It's the stupidest thing in the world, but I see some, I see things that I like, but I think, oh, he would like that too. And, and that's because we're attached because he's in mind. When I go do something, and when I go spend money, it would never occur to me these days to go spend more than a couple hundred dollars without talking to my spouse because I know whatever I'm going to bring in, I'm going to want to share and talk about, and I don't want to hide anything. I want to share it. So, because we're attached. And there are people from high school. I just went to a wedding over Christmas with people I went to high school 40 years ago. But I love those people as to much today as I loved them 40 years ago because I'm attached to them. Now ask me if I'm attached to my sister and I'll tell you no. Ask me if I'm attached to some family members or people you think, oh, of course you're attached to them. No, some attachments I've had to end because they were problematic and painful. Some people have left me because I was problematic and painful. We can end attachment. It's painful and takes a long time and it's called grieving when we end our attachments, but we can end them. I don't think you're here in this room or in the world if you're not already attached. If you weren't attached to some people, you'd be in a rubber room. So I ask you to start thinking about the people you care about, the people you want to give gifts to, the people you think about when they're special occasions, you're already attached to those people. And if you can do that, you can do it with a romantic partner too. It just takes time and evolution. So how does one learn to balance being empathetic to my wife and uh, to the wife I heard, I'm sober a year and a half and starting to feel all my trauma and it's hard to be present and empathetic for her. I think you tell her that. I think that's what you do. You say, look, I mean, it depends on where you are. If you're in a period where you guys have been getting along and you've been doing well. And I mean, I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse and I wrote it because most men I've worked with don't understand how to heal betrayal. They just don't get it. They don't understand what a woman goes through when she's betrayed and it's different than what men go through. So I wrote this book and if you hadn't read Out of the Doghouse, I recommend picking up a copy. I will make 12 cents. It's about what authors make, but you'll read a really good book that will help guide you on healing trauma in a relationship that's related to betrayal. However, um, uh, however, I wanted I had a however for that. Um, however, if you have a good relationship with her and you do feel like there's been some empathic healing and you need to turn inward to focus on you, you just need to let her know. I mean, that's the most important thing is to communicate, sweetheart, I am struggling with some things that are coming up in therapy. It's really hard for me. It makes me want to isolate, makes me want to go to bed early. It makes me not want to talk. Can you, I want you to know this. I'm not acting out. I haven't got back to, but I'm a little bit more distant because I'm really struggling. Is that okay with you? This is a relationship. She needs to be included. If she says no, you know, well, then you'd have to work that out. If she says, of course, then you'd have to work that out so that she still gets her needs met and still knows that you care, but you have this space. You have to understand that if we have been an active sex or love addict, our partners, when we back away from them on any level, they get really worried. Like, oh, is he or she at it again? And so if you just keep her in the loop of what's going on with you, that is the most important thing. She doesn't need you to be adoring every moment. She needs you to be real and honest and, and, uh, and someone she can rely on. Well, and I hope that you both have support outside of each other um, because I, I hope you're working with a qualified trauma therapist to work on that. Uh, trauma, uh, you know, so that you, so it isn't so triggering, but hopefully she's got, you know, like we have all these drop-in groups for betrayed partners and that's specifically, so you have support from other people who are in a similar situation or have been down that path. And so the, the demands on the relationship are, are, you, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, and you can't possibly be there a hundred percent for each other because you're both dealing with your own stuff. And sometimes it's going to work out great. And sometimes you're both going to be in the wrong spot and it's not going to work out. So having those safe places where you can get the support you need in the moment 
you know, um, uh, is critically useful. And, but I do think if you can verbalize and say, you know, this, this isn't you, this brings up, you know, my trauma, right. I'm working on it. And like you talked about, Dr. Rob, it's like growing um, boys to men. It's like, this is a part of being an adult is we have these conversations that are difficult. Right. I think sometimes we default to wanting to look good. Like, oh, I don't want them to know there's something wrong with me or I'll just try to, and they see right through that. That makes people very uncomfortable when we're trying to be present or try, you know, I think, and sometimes it's not unusual for all of us to struggle with intimacy. I have seen one of the greatest challenges of early couples when they're starting to date and stuff. Someone feels uncomfortable because the closeness is too much. They feel themselves judging the other person and starting to back away. And instead of saying, you know, I've, I've had some issues in my background. Sometimes I back away and get distant. They pretend like they're really present and then they don't want to be there anymore at all. Um, the hardest part is making yourself vulnerable by being honest with her about what's going on that will make her closer. Um, now she's not safe to talk to. She's still in a really angry place and says, I don't give a hoot about your trauma, blah, blah, blah. Well, then she's not safe right now for you to turn to around these issues, but she still needs to know from you what's going on so she understands where you're at. Hey, Tammy, let me put out a little bit of, I want to put out a little announcement. Um, I don't know if anybody, if you guys know or not, but I do have a podcast. It's called Sex, Love, and Addiction. I just did a great podcast today with a, a wonderful therapist named Tian Dayton, who I've known a long time. I thought it was really fabulous. She's great. Um, and if you're in the car and you're thinking, how do I work things out with my spouse? How, how do I get to the meeting without stopping here at the bookstore or, or picking someone up? I've heard that just listening to the podcast and driving around helps keep you grounded because you're hearing the message of recovery rather than caught up in your head. So we offer this. Uh, the podcast, I do blogs for Psychology Today. I'm a top five blogger for them and I have been for years. We do this group and 14 groups a week to support you guys at absolutely no cost. This is our service. So understand, yes, we run a treatment center. Yes, we'd love you to come visit us and do treatment with us if you need it. We do great work. But even if you don't, this is our opportunity to give back. And we won't ask anything for this except for that you guys show up. So um, I do really encourage you to check out the podcast. And um, by the way, I am. Rob at seekingintegrity.com. Tammy is Tammy at seekingintegrity.com. If you have questions for us, if you want to find a therapist in your neighborhood, we know a lot of people around the country. If you're looking for a good workshop, we know a lot about workshops. Tammy and I have collectively been in this field for 40 years oh, or so. <laughs> we we yeah. have all the relationships in our pocket and we're not getting paid back for referrals. So we'll no. just try to help guide you if you need help. And we're glad to do that because this is, this is our mission. So. Well, and we know the qualified referrals because, I mean, there are some people that I would send my loved one to in a heartbeat, and then there are some I want. And so, yeah, I mean, no, well, I'm here's, this, so, yeah. here's the deal, guys. Oh, I wanted to give the couple, a couple's hint before I go. This is, I'm not going to take more questions, a couple's hint. Okay. So all couples will do well, pretty much universally, when both partners are feeling full and not having a lot of needs and really feeling giving and okay. And most couples will do really well when one partner is really struggling emotionally and the other, and, and they need a lot of support and nurturing and giving. And however, when both partners are emotionally needful, things are tough because it's like both of you scratching in a dry well, each other, trying to get something. And this is part of what Tammy was saying. When we're going through these kinds of life experiences, it, it can't be that our partner is the only one we depend on because oftentimes our partner has hurt us or our partner is the person we let down. And so to get our feedback and support, we have to turn to other people. And that is why Tammy and I are always pushing these groups um, or, going, or treatment groups or workshops or, or 12, getting involved with other people who have your problem is the, is the solution to healing. You know, I'll say this and I'm going to stop. I've always believed and I understand that the body seeks to heal. If I break my arm, if I put it in a cast in the right situation, if I put a broken part of my body in the right situation, it seeks to heal. And our souls, our hearts, and our beings, we seek to heal. And I can tell you the best place to put yourself if you seek to heal is with a bunch of people with the same problem as you, whether you've been cheated on or you're the cheater, because it's in that arena where you will find your peace and your, your direction. It's just human nature. So thank you, Tammy, for joining thank us tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. See you next week. Bye now. See you Bye. soon. I'll be out in the rooms Friday, six o'clock. Bye.